So don't come away from this video going like, oh, she hates it now, she's nitpicking. It was just a chef's kiss scene. We have been building to this and here we go. So yikes. <laughs> House of the Dragon, episode five. Hoo boy, what an episode. I have once again divided my analysis and notes into sort of thematic sections, which once again have a lot of crossover, but it is also easier just to do it this way instead of just doing a chronological because I thought about doing it that way. And I just, I went with these thematic categories again. So hope that works for you. I do quickly want to say that I do think this is a very, very, very good episode. And I had a ton of fun watching it. I think it was very enjoyable television. But even though I thought it was a really amazing episode and one of the most exciting to watch and had some of the best moments that we've seen so far, I also have more problems with this episode than I did with pretty much any other, which is like a weird place to be in. And I still, again, I love this show. I think it's fantastic. And I, I still rate it very, very highly. So don't come away from this video going like, oh, she hates it now, she's nitpicking. I mean, maybe I am nitpicking, but I did have some problems with this episode, which is, a, it's weird because I feel kind of the most excited about this episode and watching it, I felt the most like, oh my God, this is so good. But it is also the episode that I had the most issues with. So let's unpack it. So my, my I've listed my categories kind of chronologically. So that's how I, that's the compromise I made. So they're not in order of importance. They're just kind of in order of appearance. I'm going to start out with Damon. There's the least to say I think about Damon in this episode. Because it's not a Damon episode, but he is the opener for the episode. So let's talk about him first. Now, I did not love the way that they decided to handle showing him offing his wife. <laughs> I did listen to the showrunner's explanation for this scene and the choices they made with the scene, the choice to have the scene at all, and then how they shot it. And I get what they were going for, but I still don't love it. <laughs> the episode, if you, if you didn't have that scene, the episode would still, it would be pretty clear based on how everyone is talking about things and based on what people are saying, etc., you would be pretty certain that Damon had killed his wife. So if you imagine just that you're starting the, the episode and we just skip over that scene, it doesn't exist, we cut it out completely, and we start with Viserys and Rhaenyra traveling to see uh, Corlys Velaryon. If we just opened there, we in very short order hear from Rhaenys that, uh-oh, there's been an accident. Well, we hear Corlys say, oh, we're meeting under tragic circumstances. Rhaenys is like, yeah, you know, Damon's wife is dead and she stood to inherit runestone, blah, 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 blah. So we would quickly learn this information if we hadn't had that scene in the beginning. And then later, of course, we do see Damon confronted at the wedding about him most likely having offed his wife and the way that it reacts to it. If you, you watch that scene, even if you hadn't seen the beginning of the episode, you'd be like, I think you did it, but it's not being explicitly stated. And I much, much prefer when things are not so explicitly stated, when, especially if in universe there is some doubt and there is some uncertainty, that it's conveyed in that way, where you, a reasonable person could say, I'm pretty sure he did it, but I don't know that he did. Now the showrunners were saying that, oh, well, you know, they wanted Matt Smith to play the scene where you know, you're not really sure why he's there. Like, you're not really sure if he did decide to go home to kill her or not. He just is there. And then he like takes advantage of the opportunity, but it's still not clear if that was his goal. And like, I agree that Matt Smith played the role that way. Like in, in the scene, that's what he did with what he was given. But in the context of the story, there is no other reason, no other explanation for what he could be possibly doing there if that's not what he was there to do. So the idea that, oh, it's still uncertain if that's why he was there. I mean, not really. Because like, why the F else is he standing in the middle of nowhere waiting for his lady wife, looking like a Jedi warrior ready to have a lightsaber duel? You know, like, like why else would he be there? So yes, he played it that way where you're like, based on his facial expressions, it's not clear exactly what he's up to, but it's not because he would have a different reason for being there. There is no like, is he there to kill her or is he there to what? Is he there to what? There's no other thing he could be there to be doing. So I, I just feel like when they're like, oh, we wanted to leave it uncertain. I mean, but you didn't though. It's very certain that that's what he was there to do. And when they were like, you know, the fact that he was ready to walk away, um, but it's only when she calls after him that he decides to bludgeon her. I mean, maybe, or he was going to bludgeon her anyway. He was just taking his time about it, whatever. But I mean, if he was there to kill her, which my reading of the scene is, there isn't really any other reason for him to be there. So I watch that scene and go, Yes, Damon is there to kill her. That's his reason for being there. At which point I'm like, okay, but what was your big plan, Damon? Like it happened to work out that she fell off her horse. And you're like, great, well, 
you know, that worked out in my favor. Uh, but what were you going to do if that didn't happen? Or if you fell off her horse, but was like, fine. Cause like, just because you fell off a horse doesn't mean that you're like paralyzed. So she seemed to be paralyzed, but if she hadn't been, if she had just jumped up and like took out her sword and started fighting him, you know, like the, there was no guarantee that was going to work out. So like, what was he doing there? If he was there to kill her, what was his plan? And if he wasn't there to kill her, what was he there to do? I can't think of any reason for him to be there. So I just don't think it's as strong a scene as they think that it is. Um, and I would have much preferred, again, either to completely cut that scene and to just have the other characters be talking about it where you're like, I'm pretty sure he did it. Or if you did want us to like actually see the woman, like have an actress play this character and have us actually put a face to a name and see her. I think having her in the beginning say, I'm going to go riding off alone. And you can kind of see her riding, riding, riding. Maybe you cut to a scene where the horse is now riding riderless and the camera pans over to where she's now left and it looks like she's fallen from her horse. And maybe you catch a glimpse of a shadowy figure in the distance that seems to be leaving, but you can't, you can't really be sure that's a person or who that person is. And then you'd, you'd still have, you know, eyes on this character and you'd still see what had happened to her. And you'd still have reason to think that this was not an accident, but it wouldn't be so like blatantly Damon that did it. And also weirdly Damon considering not doing it when he's clearly there too. I just, I just don't think that scene worked the way they thought it did. So it was like nearly there. <laughs> it could have been great. And I, and I I get what they were going for, but I don't think it worked. Um, so we, again, we don't see a ton of Damon in the rest of the episode, um, but I did like that. I, I mentioned in my previous video that I like how they've developed that Rhaenyra and Damon like to speak to each other in Old Valyrian. And this did feel kind of like planting and payoff where they we've seen them largely in private. There isn't actually a ton of people around that might overhear them using Old Valyrian because they just feel like it, because they like to speak to each other in Old Valyrian. And I felt like having established that this is a thing that they do was so great because now in this scene, in this this very, very full um, wedding scene where they are surrounded and crushed by like the tons of people around them and they want to have a private conversation and they switch to Old Valyrian and it doesn't come out of nowhere. It's not like the first time they're doing it. It's not like, I guess they can talk Old Valyrian, how convenient. No, like we've seen them do this a lot. So you're like, well, I mean, that's why you speak Old Valyrian. It's for times like these so that you can have this conversation in front of everybody and, and no one is the wiser about what you're talking about. So I just liked um, how they had set that up so that when it happens, you're like, there you go. And then of course we get to see the beginning of Damon's interest in Lena Valarian, which I think, which I think was handled, you know, there wasn't much to it, but you know, it was enough there where you're like, aha, uh -huh, see what he's, I see where his radar is now. And then I just also, <laughs> I realized, you know, having watched this episode and seeing the the promo for the next episode, that they've got three actresses uh, who will have played Lena Valarian at the very least. Maybe there will be a fourth, but I doubt it. But there were at least, th there's a little girl. Now we've got like teenage-ish Lena. And then in the next episode, we're going to get yet a third Lena who's even older. So for a character that doesn't get a ton of screen time, that's a lot of actresses. <laughs> playing that character. Okay, but I want to move next to Viserys. Um, and there's not a ton going on with him character wise, like specific to him. He's more significant in terms of the way that he's represented in the group, if that makes sense. Like this isn't a Viserys introspective episode. We do get some introspection, of course we do. But in general, I just wanted to comment on how good a job they've done gradually showing his decline, where it doesn't come out of nowhere. It doesn't feel weird and exaggerated. It doesn't feel you know, like he went from being fine to being, you know, to, to doing badly. From the first episode, he seemed pretty hale and hearty, but we did already see that, you know, he was having some health issues. In the second episode, um, his hairline very subtly seemed to be receded and his hair in general seemed to be a little more, um, like to, to be thinned a little bit and he just looked a little more haggard, but it wasn't like aggressive. You were just like, he looks a little, a little rougher around the edges. And like we, again, in private see, um, the escalation of his own health issues. And throughout the episodes, we've just seen that gradually where like the way that his face looks and the way that his hair looks, it's just been a gradual, he looks, and the way the actor plays it as well, where he's like slower and hunches more. And then by this episode, of course, he's coughing and there's a lot more obvious signs that he's quite ill. Um, but I just think that they've done a really good job of making it this gradual change that you're like, he just looks worse and worse and worse. Uh, moving next then to Alicent. I did like, and I have liked in general, how they've shown, you know, the different, the different people who are whispering in her ear, the different forces that are influencing her. So obviously in the beginning of this episode, we see her talking to her dad and it is a moment that would be quite harrowing for her because she would feel quite alone now that her father's gone. Uh, even though she's the queen, you know, 
she, she's she is a woman in a Targaryen filled uh, castle, so she would feel quite alone and powerless. It makes sense that she would be distraught about this, especially because she would feel uh, somewhat responsible for what happened to her father. So him saying, hey, you know, it's time to choose. It's time to grow up. It's time to realize that it's your kids on the line. You may think Rhaenyra is your friend and we can all be family, but that's just not the truth. That's not the reality. You may think I'm heartless. You may think I'm cutthroat, but I'm trying to protect your kids. So we can see Allison to start to kind of come to grips with, with that, with the reality of that and what that will mean for her and the, the tough choices she's going to have to make. Now, what I don't super love or get, and we'll get into this a little more in my next section, but Kristen Cole. I haven't talked in my review videos very much about like book to show changes because in my personal opinion, whether or not an adaptation is loyal to a book is not what determines whether or not it is a good adaptation or a, a good TV show or a good film. Like it's first and foremost, the job of a show or, or a film is to be a good show or is to be a good film. So if the choices they make, make for a good show, make for a good story, make for an equally good story, even if it's different from the original, then by all means. <laughs> So I think it's a point of interest sometimes to compare the two, but I don't think that is a good metric by which to judge an adaptation, which is why I've tended not to bring it up, except for when I'm like, who, because I have read the book, I know where this is going. So it's interesting that they're setting it up already or that they're doing something where I don't see how they can follow the book if they're doing this now. So I, it, it comes up, but in general, I don't really like to do book to show um, comparison too much when judging the show. But in this episode in particular, I I, mean, I want to talk about changes they made from the book because they are pretty significant changes. And they, this is a, they have already made some changes before and those changes didn't bother me. I didn't really bring them up very much because again, I don't think that that's useful as a way to judge the show. The fact that Allison and Rhaenyra were friends, that's a pretty big departure from the book. They were not friends before she married her father, before Allison married Rhaenyra's father. So I, when I saw that they did that, I was like, okay, I mean, this is this is because they've they've aged up the characters, changed the timeline of things a bit. Fine, that's, that's fine. This could create, you know, even more tension and even more dramatic moments because you've done that. So let's see what you do with it. Got no issue with it. Let's see where that goes. That could be very, very interesting even though that's not necessarily something that's in the book. But so we come to this point where Allison is confronting Kristen Cole. And this was a, a scene that I enjoyed watching, but what at first began to happen in the scene and what I thought that they would continue to do throughout the scene was that Kristen and, and Allison would speak past each other the entire time. So at first that was happening. Allison was saying, you know, like the princess might have sort of kind of done a naughty thing and I know you don't want to like spill the beans, but she might have done a thing that she shouldn't have done and maybe you, you could maybe tell me about it. And of course, Allison is thinking of Damon and, and you're watching it going, Kristen is go thinking that she's talking about him. And so I expected the scene from there to have Kristen just say, yes, it happened. And then for Allison to take that as confirmation that Rhaenyra had been with Damon, even though what Kristen was confirming was that he had been with her, but that at no point were they talking about the same thing, you know, that kind of a scene, which, you know, is uh, creates great dramatic tension. And I do enjoy scenes that are well done when you have miscommunication like that, that doesn't feel forced because they would speak in illusions in a situation like that. Cause they're both like, she's the princess and you're not supposed to tell on her. So we're just going to talk vaguely. And we think we're talking about the same thing, but we're not. But then he immediately is like, yes, it happened. I did it. And I was like, okay, so that's clear then. There's no miscommunication. Allison is not walking away from this conversation going, she was with Damon. And so when that happened, I was like, okay, well, so now I don't get why Allison would be super duper pissed at Rhaenyra. Like that she would be a bit disappointed and a bit surprised at Rhaenyra, I guess that checks out. But the way that now we're to understand later in the episode that she feels so utterly betrayed you know, it is, it, is, it is war now between us kind of attitude that she's been lied to. I mean, that simply isn't the case. You asked Rhaenyra about Daemon. And even though I talked in the previous episode about how Rhaenyra plays with the truth a bit when she's like, no, I wasn't with Daemon. I mean, she was a bit with Daemon, but she didn't actually do the nasty with Daemon. So when that's what Alicent is asking about, Rhaenyra is like, no, I didn't do it with Daemon. And so when Alicent finds out that she did do the nasty with Kristen Cole, that she would be like, okay, well, so she's not as innocent as I thought she was, but the thing that my father was dismissed for was was spreading these rumors that she was with Damon. That's what I asked her about. And that's what my dad was spreading. And turns out she was doing it, but not with Damon. 
it's the fact that it was Damon that made it so much more of a controversy when this was the going rumor. So it just, in that moment, it felt like less motivation for Allison to turn against Rhaenyra. So then I thought, okay, I guess this might be the beginning of the end for them because I obviously hadn't seen the rest of the episode yet. Or I was like, okay, Alicent is now starting to realize that Rhaenyra is not as innocent as she thought, that she is not as honest as she thought, and she's going to keep an eye on her, that they, she can't actually trust Rhaenyra the way that she thought that she could. But no, we go zero to 60. After she learns this from Kristen Cole, she decides she is completely team Kristen Cole and completely anti Rhaenyra. Even though Kristen is the one who did it with Rhaenyra. So I just, I don't really understand the thinking that we're meant to understand is going on with Alicent. Like her behavior, this doesn't really make sense as a motivation for her behavior. So this is where I kind of want to talk about the book because it is true in the book that Kristen Cole um, is team Rhaenyra first and then switches to team Alicent. And that does happen. And because of how they had made them friends, uh, Alicent and Rhaenyra, and because of the way that they'd, sh they'd confirmed that Rhaenyra d is into Kristen and he's into her, I was like, okay, so how are they going to go about this? How are they going to resolve this? How are they going to make him go team Alicent? Because that has to happen. So again, this is when I thought that the conversation between him and Alicent would go where she's talking about Damon and he's talking about himself, but he does come to find out that Alicent is talking about Damon and that he takes that as confirmation that Rhaenyra did do it with Damon, and he feels betrayed by that, at which point then he would turn against Rhaenyra and be like, oh, she's, you know, an incestuous whore, and I can't believe that I was with her, and screw that, I'm gonna go be team Allison. But that's not what happens. <laughs> he confesses that he did a wrong thing, and he's still into her, and now he's gonna go team Allison. Why? Like, it doesn't make sense why they are now joining forces, so to speak, why they are now on the same team. I just, it doesn't work. It doesn't work for me anyway. Whereas in the book, so we get kind of two different versions of events that are each equally possibly true because it's told like a history book. So you don't know what happens because it's told as well, varying accounts tell us different versions of events. Here's what one account tells us happens. Here's what another account tells us happens. Maybe neither are true, you know, but so in the book, the two versions, the two possible versions of the reason for their falling out between Kristen Cole and Rhaenyra Targaryen is either he confesses his love to her and she spurns him or she tries to seduce him and he spurns her. And the show was kind of like, we're going to do both. <laughs> and then we're going to have also him have a chat with Alicent and then like, it, it just, it doesn't really make sense to me. Like the, the chain of events and the like cause and effect of that just completely falls apart for me in the way that they did it in this episode. And the reason they did it this way in this episode, I think, I'm pretty sure, and I'm pretty sure I'm right, is because they just wanted to have a violent altercation at the wedding. So they had to like put everybody in places so that they could have this like epic wedding moment. And that felt, that didn't work for me. It didn't. So then moving on to Kristen and Joffrey, which is now what I just alluded to, the violent altercation at the wedding. So again, in the book, which is again, I'm, this is not a thing that I want to make a habit of, is doing book versus show. That's not what I'm here to do. As long as the show is telling a good story, I don't care. That said, in the book, Kristen Cole does kill this this character, this favorite of Lainor Valarian. But it happens at a tourney. So it is like sanctioned, licensed, you know, accidents happen. We've seen them happen. Violence happens, you know. Even if you're not meaning to kill someone, it happens. So by the time this happens, Kristen is already Team Alicent. That transition has already occurred. And at, while he is wearing Alicent's favor, you know, at Tourney, where she's, uh, as we've seen before, you know, when, when women give their favorites to their favorite knights, he's wearing the Queen's, Alicent's favor when he faces Sir Joffrey. And uh, I, I believe he... he hits him in the head or his destroys his helmet or whatever. And Joffrey doesn't die immediately on sight. He does die a few days later. So it is, Kristen is directly responsible for his eventual death. So this does upset people. Um, but at that point, Kristen is already become a favorite of the Queens. And when he did this thing, he was wearing her favor. So she's, is, she's tied to the action by virtue of having given him her favor when having him wearing it when he does it. So the fact that she would support him after that and be like, piss off, it's fine that he killed him, it doesn't matter, I still support him, does make more sense because they have already been now more aligned before that happens. 
it happens in a situation where no one could really be too mad that he, in a tourney, killed somebody because it happens. He didn't set out to kill him. And he was wearing the queen's favor. So the queen would be like, stick by her man, uh, not throw him under the bus, so to speak. So like that all just kind of like makes sense as a chain of events. Whereas here, Kristen attacks Joffrey in the middle of this wedding pretty much unprompted as far as we can tell. We've seen, we see Joffrey talking to Kristen and being like, hey, I know that you're like sleeping with the princess. I'm sleeping with the prince. So, you know, let's look out for each other or whatever that conversation's supposed to be. And then we don't really see anything else between them and suddenly Kristen is killing him. And I know the showrunner, I mean, when I watched it, this is what I was figuring. And then when I watched the post-show commentary, they confirmed what I suspected was that Apparently, if you have a wedding in the world of Game of Thrones, there has to be violence because we've started that as a tradition. So they decided that they would take this, the killing, the, this killing that does occur in the book between Kristen killing Joffrey, and they're just going to move it up and put it in the wedding and make it this like violent brawl. And I get, it does make a very, very compelling moment of television where this is happening. The tensions are high, you're like, what the F is happening? It is a brutal killing. Um, there's a lot of people in the room who have a stake in what just happened. So it makes for an exciting moment in TV. But again, in universe, they're pretty good at like having cost and consequences feel appropriate in universe where the reactions and the results of people's behaviors um, check out. And here, the idea that, that this white cloak could just outright brutalize and murder this guest at a wedding unprompted and just walk away from that and just tralala into the godswood where he's like, I have brought dishonor upon my family. You know, I must unalive myself. Um, I just don't buy that. <laughs> I think he would be, you know, he'd be arrested. He'd be decloaked. He would, this would not be fine. They wouldn't be like, oh, okay, well, you know, go sleep it off. We're going to go ahead and marry Rhaenyra to the prince like right quick because that was a little bit rough. Let's have a, a shotgun wedding. I just... It just, in universe, like, I just don't believe that that would happen. Like, Alicent would have to do quite a lot. Um, she would have to really, really stick her neck out for him to be like, I don't care that he just brutally murdered that dude. He's my guy. Um, sticking by Kristen Cole because he slept with Rhaenyra. <laughs> so now I support him. You know, it just, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. So I, I don't like that change. And it feels like they only made these changes so that they could like hurry up and have this brutal killing at a wedding because that's what we do in the world of Game of Thrones. We have deaths at weddings. And it just, that's not a good reason to do it either. Uh, moving then to another thing that is from the book <laughs> that I am curious to see how much they are going to do that in the show. It seems like they are, but not quite. So what I'm talking about is the greens and the blacks. So in the book, it is not at a wedding feast, but Alicent does show up to a feast wearing a green dress. And at the feast in which that happens in the book, Rhaenyra is wearing a black and red Targaryen dress, like wearing her house colors. And from this, we get the sort of factions, the people that support the queen and the people that support Rhaenyra are the greens and the blacks because of the colors of their gowns. Like that's the genesis of it. So we get this dramatic moment where, where Alicent comes in wearing the green dress. And if you've read the book, you're like, we're doing the green dress. <laughs> like that's what this is. As soon as she walks in, you know that that's what's happening right now. The tensions between Alicent and Rhaenyra are over the succession in the book. You know, the fact that she wants her sons to inherit. Rhaenyra has been named the heir and it's tense. And Viserys is like, I'm not doing nothing about it. Could just, you know, great king. But so here, the fact that she's, you know, doing this, like, it's not really a declaration of war in the book, the way it's pitched here, where uh, what's his face is like, you know, the color that the beacon burns when they call their banners to war is green, so she's wearing green. Like, it's not all that in the book, but it is noteworthy that she wears green and it becomes a symbolic color for these factions. So here, the fact that she's like going to war because she found out that Rhaenyra slept with the dude that guards her door. It just, again, it's another, I'm like, Allison's behavior just stopped making sense in this episode. Eventually her doing these things and that everything that happened in this episode being a part of why she would turn on Rhaenyra, yes, but the fact that that's the catalyst that makes her go anti Rhaenyra doesn't really make sense. But again, in this scene, like I said, uh, in the book, Rhaenyra is wearing a black and red dress. And this is how we get the factions that are the greens and the blacks. But obviously in this scene, this is a wedding feast, which it's not a wedding feast at, in the book, but this is a wedding feast and Rhaenyra is wearing white and gold. 
Um, so if we are going to have factions that are called the Greens and the Blacks in the show, which we haven't done that yet because this would be the genesis of it, so that would have to come later, or if they just wanted to have the green dress moment without necessarily having that become the name of a queen's side faction. So we'll see. So this episode I do think was really, really, really good, and I've mostly been complaining about it, so I want to explain why I do think it was good. So when we get to the wedding feast, this did feel like a moment that the show had earned. And that is so important. When you have an epic moment in a show, it should feel like we've been building up to this moment. And if something happens, you should, like the payoff should be there. It should feel like we have been building to this and here we go. So this scene, we've had pretty patient development throughout the show of all of the politics that are going on with everybody. All the different agendas, the different factions, the the different alliances, the all of these machinations that have been going on in all of these episodes. And so we get to the wedding scene and to have Viserys sitting there struggling with his dinner and be kind of oblivious to how all of these people in this room are mixing and dancing and, and working out their politics right there in this room. It was just a chef's kiss scene because you just feel all of these tensions that you are aware of because the show's done a great job telling you about all of them leading up to this moment. I mean, it feels like it's, you know, ready to bubble over. It feels like a, you know, a chemical reaction that we have these volatile forces all being put in the same room together. No good can come from this. And the music, I've said before that Ramin Djawadi is my favorite composer and the music that he wrote for the wedding scene, Chef's Kiss, absolute perfect music to add to that storytelling. What we saw going on, the choreography of the dancing also, a very good choreography to visually convey that sense of this fraught, tense, overflowing, machination-filled chamber. <laughs> but just everything about that scene and the, the tension building and building and the music and the beat and the rhythm and the dancing all escalating and escalating and escalating until we get the violent altercation between Kristen and Joffrey, which I already explained why that doesn't really narratively work. But in the scene, that is an amazing building of tensions until it does all go kaboom with Kristen and Joffrey. So we, we randomly kept the tradition of a, a death at a, a Song of Ice and Fire wedding. Don't know if we needed that. But otherwise, the way that they orchestrated that scene, everything about what they did in that scene, all of the different people talking, the looks people give each other, the tensions on the dance floor, the way the dance and the music are basically echoing what's going on with the characters. It was amazing. It was absolutely what it should have been. And as always, the performances from all of the actors are amazing. The cast they have on House of the Dragon is just, is incredible. Everyone is giving it their all. They are in every scene doing so much storytelling just in their, the, their facial expressions and the way they deliver lines, their body language. Everyone in this show is just perfectly cast for their roles and they are doing so much storytelling that is outside of what is written in the script. So it's a joy to watch. So next episode, we're going to get the time skip, uh, where we get new actresses playing Rhaenyra and Alicent. Personally, I feel equal parts excited and nervous about that. It will be a bit jarring, no matter how well they do it, it will be jarring to suddenly have different actresses playing these roles because we've come to really, really know the actresses we've seen so far. and We've come to really like them and we've grown attached to them. So I do really hope that, I know that they cast the young actresses who played Rhaenyra and Alicent because they were looking for actresses that would look visually, that their faces, you know, their features would look similar to the actresses who are playing the older versions of them. You know, they just look like a good match. But I really, really hope that the actresses also worked together and the showrunners had them work together so that not just their faces look similar, but that the way that they are performing the roles is similar, that they would deliver their lines with similar intonation, that they would have similar body language, that they would perform these roles in a way that is also similar. So I really hope that we see that from them, that they don't suddenly start behaving differently. <laughs> like these are now the interpretations of these characters by different actresses. You know, they should still feel like the same people where the way that they move and the way that they speak and the way that they express themselves, um, you know, facially should be the same, at least, or believably similar. Uh, what we brief glimpse we saw of how Viserys is looking, I mean, he collapsed at the end of this episode. So what we saw of him in the next episode, I mean, he is looking rough. So yikes. <laughs> but yeah, I'm gonna uh, miss the actresses playing the young versions of Alison Rainier. I think the actresses did a fantastic job. 
So claps for them. They were great and we will miss them. I'm excited to see the new actresses, but I will miss the old, the previous actresses. Um, and I'm very excited to see the kids, to see Aegon now a little older and where he's actually a character in the story rather than, you know, a, a plot device, a MacGuffin, <laughs> the baby MacGuffin, to see these new characters now also come into the mix and come into play and start to have an effect on what's going on. So I'm excited to see that. Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below about episode five. Have you read the book? Have you not read the book? Do you care about the book? Do the changes that they made make sense to you? Um, do you have an explanation for why this actually totally checks out? Because I would love to love the changes they made. They just really don't make sense to me right now. So if you have a good explanation for why it totally makes sense what they did or why the character's behavior totally makes sense, please tell me because I would love to know. Uh, whatever you want to let me know. I post videos on Saturdays. Other random times well, it's only Saturday, so like and subscribe. Join my Patreon if you feel so inclined and I'll see you when I see you. Bye.